my name is Nick Randolph. I run a tech company called uh, Built to Roam. Um, we're a consulting company that works in sort of the mobile app space. Um, sort of historically very Windows centric, um, but we do full stack now. So iOS, Android, Windows. I'd say that we do Windows Phone, but that's kind of like a non-market right now. Um, so it's very much Windows and connected devices. So, um, And so hopefully this session gives you a bit of an idea of the direction that Microsoft's going in the sort of the, the design space. Um, and we'll touch on a little bit of, of the history, where Microsoft's come from. Um, and over the last 10 years, I've kind of rode the wave over multiple changes around their design language, um, particularly around Windows Phone, then Windows 8, and then Windows 10. Um, it seems like every new year we have to you know learn a new framework learn a new design language um, I think one of the big changes we're now starting to see particularly around this fluent design um, is that they're treating it not like one set of designs they're treating it like an ongoing journey um, and you'll see that as a recurring theme around Windows 10 in general so it's you know more of a service model that's they're, they're doing iterative updates and changes um, and every time we see new insider drops we'll see just, just subtle tweaking of the UI to, to adapt to some of these new changes in their design language um, so with <laughs> back in the old days when apps used to look really awesome um, this is kind of how we've sort of evolved from you know, very text-driven interfaces. Uh, we started to see you know, the power of GPUs coming in and, and the ability to have you know, high definition graphics. Um, it was somewhat abused in around the XP time frame where we sort of ended up with rounded corners and transparency. Um, and particularly around the sort of the Vista time frame, we saw machine performance go like nose diving until you turned off all of the fully designed stuff. Um, and one of the dangers that Microsoft obviously runs into with, with now going back down that path of you know transparency and uh, you know using opacity levels and things like that is of course around performance and, and that's one of the considerations they do need to pay attention to um, and we'll see how they've, they've adapted to that um, so your low-end devices will still work um, all the way through to your really high-end devices and of course it's a scale as to how much of the nice new UI that you get depending on you know, performance and things like that. So what does this mean for developers? Um, well, we've also gone on a story. So, you know, Windows Forms is still sort of floating around um, and it very much still kind of looks like that. Um, it doesn't really evolve much until you get into sort of the WPF sp space. Um, and with the release of WPF, there was a lot of focus around, you know, just let's pick this sort of X XP kind of look and feel up and run with that. Um, and now, if you jump into a vanilla WPF project, you still have to start off with that and you know go by third-party contro controls and you know rapidly try and change your designs um, so that they look much more modern. Um, luckily, that stuff is possible with WPF. It's quite easy to restyle controls because the whole mentality around XAML was so that you could restyle things. Um, um, it just a little, requires a little bit of work to get you onto into a sort of more modern kind of look and feel. Um, when I mentioned that I sort of rode the wave with Microsoft around the design language, um, when they sort of introduced Windows Phone to the world, one of the things that they really put a lot of effort into is coming up with a new design language. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but this is sort of the, the first step into that sort of more connected experience. And so you can see here this sort of panoramic display, which is a transition away from vertical scrolling across to the more horizontal and wrapping experience on the phone um, to again try and you know, build a better experience. Um, this kind of morphed into um, a much richer kind of interface for sort of the Windows 8, 8.1 time timeframe. Um, and again, when we're starting to look at where Microsoft is going in terms of fluent design, we're starting to see things with a lot more depth, a lot more perspective, um, and hopefully a much more connected experience. Um, one of the big problems you have with lots of apps on a platform, and you particularly get this in Windows because you have that windowing effect, is that apps all look different, right? And when they sit one on top of the other, like you get in Windows or you get on Mac OS, you start to get a very jarring kind of experience um, and hopefully as more and more apps start to evolve and actually adapt this what we should start to see is actually those apps the the boundaries between those apps will start to go away and you start to see a much more connected experience and so you know you can see here some combinations of sort of opacity levels and you know um, sort of shading and things like that it gives you actually this sort of almost 3d perspective um, Okay, so designs change all the time. Why, why do we really care about this now? Um, well, I'll make a point, okay. Most of the, the interfaces we're gonna talk about now have a touch screen, and so there's a big call out here. If this day and age your Mac doesn't have a touch screen, 
you need to think about a platform that does, right? Because the, the evolution forward um, is around touchscreen as one of the many types of input that you're going to get around your displays. Um, historically, we've, we've always built apps around like a 2D style interface. Um, and as I mentioned in the keynote, um, we're starting to move into much more than just 2D. Okay, on one end of the spectrum, we've got like 3D applications. On the other one, we've got one and 2D style applications. Um, and we need a framework or we need a platform that's going to be able to support those. Okay, so if you think about it in the Microsoft space, okay, so we talk about mobile, we talk about tablet, we talk about laptops. Okay, so, so Microsoft's addressed that market, you know, quite well over the last five years in terms of having a single or building an app that works across those. Okay, what they haven't really been able to, to leverage that is across their other devices. Okay, so we start to break away from your traditional PC type market and start to look at things like Xbox. We start to look at HoloLens. Um, we start to look at you know IoT type devices. Okay, historically those have all been very fragmented markets. So, you know, back four or five years ago, if you were building an Xbox app, you were building it using a game development kit, and then they kind of morphed around the Windows t um, 8 timeframe. They actually had a development kit that was based around WinJS. Okay, but you couldn't take your Windows 8 app and just run it on the Xbox because it, 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 it just w didn't work like that, right? You had to go through a different submission process, even though it might have a lot of the code reused. Um, but it was still a very, very different framework. Today, we're building apps that work across desktop, phone, and the Xbox. And you can take that same application and now have it run on HoloLens, and you can have it running headless on an IoT type device. So it's a really powerful framework to actually do that. But how do you go about designing an app for that? Okay, um, because what works well on, a, say, a desktop display doesn't necessarily work well on a HoloLens, or it doesn't necessarily work on an IoT device where you don't have a touch input, or you don't have an input that you can use mouse and keyboard for. And so one of the, the struggles has been, okay, well, what's the, how do we take our current sort of design experience and adapt it for those platforms? Well, we need to consider about input, okay? So if we look at the traditional 2D displays, then typically touch and mouse and keyboard are the primary forms for those. If we're looking at Xbox, then it's the controller um, or actually the remote is quite important as well. Um, and just a note there is that, yeah, sure, you can take your UWP desktop application and have it run on an Xbox, but what you'll first find is that it's a really nasty experience unless you do some extra effort. Um, and so there's a little bit of a marketing pitch here that Microsoft goes, hey, you can build this app, that, what, this is gonna run everywhere. Okay, but the reality is that you still need to do some extra work to support it, okay? Um, by default, your UWP app is gonna have a little bit of a mouse cursor. That doesn't work on an Xbox, I wanna use my controller, okay? The next thing that you're gonna run into, so you switch it into controller mode, is that as you navigate around the app, you're, you get stuck and you don't have the focus on the screen and you're going, well, what's in focus now, right? Because you're so used to building an app that's mouse and keyboard and you can just drag your mouse cursor and click on things or you can touch on things. All of a sudden, you've forgotten to go back and actually say, okay, well, how do I use my cursor keys on the keyboard, okay? If you had actually put the effort into your UWP app originally to support keyboard properly, so you can, you know, which we used to do in WinForms apps back when it was hev heavily keyboard driven. If you were to use cursor keys and actually get that to work in your UWP app, the transition to Xbox is almost seamless because the cursor, the controller or the remote actually picks up on the same cursor keys that you'd use on your desktop, right? So do the extra legwork on, on UWP for the desktop, you actually get the benefits when you transition to Xbox. Um, the next thing, big thing is, is around speech and, and using the microphone as a, as a form of input. Okay, this is something that we've all struggled with on apps because voice recognition, let's be honest, is not great. Okay, like I'm, <laughs> the number of demos where they get up on, on, on stage and they go, hey Cortana, <laughs> hey Cortana, you know, it just, half the time it doesn't work. And you know, the times that it does, they talk in really slow, clear English. I can't even do it. Um, and, and you know, the reality is that the microphone pickup is just not great. And so you have to put a lot of effort to get it to even to do very basic instructions. Having said that, we are progressing down that path incredibly quickly. Like the voice recognition capabilities is improving every single time. Um, we look at it, and if you look at things like the Amazon Echo and stuff like that, we're starting to see that the voice capabilities of those devices are, are very quickly making them an accessible device. Um, the next thing we need to think about is that um, these additional kind of um, displays like the HoloLens, they don't use a mouse and keyboard, right? They use 
vision, okay? So basically, as you move around and look at things, you're kind of bringing those elements into focus and that's what you're directing your input at. Um, and then they use your hand gestures to actually select and, and clear things. Um, so that's another form of input that we've got to be aware of. The other one that's, that comes to mind is also the stylus input. Okay, Microsoft's been in the stylus game for years. You know, back in the tablet PC days, um, they, they were the first one into that market where they were doing you know, proper hand recognition. Unfortunately, iteration over iteration, and even if you look at the other, uh, other platforms that are doing stylus input or pencil input, <laughs> um, they're still, the hand recognition is still not great, and the actual the adoption into the platform is still not great. One of the things we're seeing in the next wave of Windows 10 is that the use of um, stylus input is going to be everywhere, right? Instead of it being a panel at the bottom, you're going to start to see controls being used across the board where you can actually tap into them and start typing immediately right next to them, and it's actually going to be a much more connected experience from that perspective. The next thing we need to think about is the output of all these devices, right? Because in addition to, you know, clicking on things, we kind of need to think about, okay, well, how are we presenting information back to the user? Particularly on the 0D and the 3D types ends of the spectrum, we need to think about what type of display we're actually going to be presenting, or what type of output we're presenting back to the user. So if you look at the outputs, and I know it's small, down this end, you're talking about light, sound, um, haptic feedback, that type of thing. And then the other end of the spectrum, you're really th thinking of beyond 2D. You're thinking about, okay, well, how do I present a 3D model of this, okay? And that's where the power of HoloLens really is. As much as Microsoft touts the fact that you can build a flat 2D UWP experience and have it run on HoloLens, it's like having a flat canvas on the wall, right? Okay, you might look at it, you know, you could have like Netflix or you could have Stan running on a screen. It's like you walk around the room and you can, you can watch the video but do other things at the same time. It's like, yeah, well that's pretty limited, right? We've got to get beyond that and start to think about, okay, well, actually I want a 3D experience that lets me map out the brain and pull it apart so I can see it and stuff like that. That's the type of thing that we should really be exploring in that 3D space. Um, and so we need a design language that's going to go with that. In addition to having a spectrum of different devices, um, we've moved beyond just the consumption of apps. Okay? We're, we're rapidly getting into a world where we want to build more than just 140 characters. Okay? We want to build you know, video sequences and overlay text and, and you know, actually create a story out of it. And one of the things that sort of really excited a lot of people at Build was just some of the connected experiences that they were able to build by taking sort of photos and videos that you, you built on your device, so you've taken them with a the camera or you know, it's been shared from friends, and actually build them into a story and actually compose those, and then take some of the cloud smarts and actually apply that. And so they did some really rich animations. And so you can really see the direction that Microsoft's trying to encourage developers to go in that direction. So we're talking about fairly rich apps. Um, I'll give you the hint, these are not cheap and easy to build apps, as much as Microsoft says that they are, um, but there's incredible power that we can expose um, out of connecting a lot of the cloud experiences to what's coming down the line in terms of um, the UWP platform. Um, okay, so I'll take a, a, a bit of a back step again. So whatever happened to Metro? Did, has people heard of Metro? as a design language? Okay, so back in the Windows Phone 7, when Microsoft back got into that space, they, they announced this thing called Metro. Um, it subsequently got referred to as just a code name. Okay, we're always gonna come up with a better name. Um, I think that there was a bit of legal action involved there. So we ended up with modern UI, and then over time they iterated into the Microsoft Design Language and Microsoft Design Language 2. Um, and uh, they finally got to the point where this is ridiculous, okay, we can't have a Microsoft Design Language 3. Um, so they came up with another name, um, and hopefully the, the idea behind moving away from something very formal called the Microsoft Design Language to something called the Fluent Design um, is to sort of try and capture that, that market that's really looking for inspiration again. Uh, I will make a note that over time what we have seen as we move from Metro across into the sort of the Windows 8 timeframe um, is that we have seen a lot of consolidation. Microsoft's tried one thing on one platform, they've tried another thing on another platform, and they've tried to marry the gap between them. Because you can imagine on a Windows phone or a phone based device, um, the interface is going to look dramatically different from what it would on a desktop device. And so you can see here that there's a conflict between, so these two first ones are the Windows Phone 8.1 and Windows 8.1. Um, 
in the Windows 10 space, you can see that they're almost identical. Okay, so they've tried to find that happy medium between the two. Now, it's not to say that they'll always present exactly the same on mobile, desktop, Xbox, etc. Um, there's definitely uh, some smarts that need to be built in controls to make sure they adapt to the usability of those particular devices. But it should be a common theme across them. So, you know, a user transitioning from one device to another should be very familiar and comfortable with the, the app experience. Okay, but what about the other platforms? Okay, if you look at the design guidelines for things like iOS, they talk about difference, where content is the hero. They talk about clarity, okay, making things obvious. This is stuff that Microsoft's been preaching actually for quite a long time, okay? So this is actually nothing new. They also talk about these sort of three rules for building apps. So design for touch, which is quite ironic given they've got no touch support on Mac OS. Um, they talk about readability, clearly to make sure things are consumable, um, and adaptive layouts. And again, the irony here is that their devices aren't adaptive, okay? You build for a device, and it might be portrait landscape, and, but the idea is that you build for phone, tablet, etc. cetera. Um, whereas in the Windows world, okay, we do need to be truly adaptive, okay? Because you can imagine a desktop, we can have app full screen, and then we can consolidate down into no bigger than what would be displayed on a, on a phone interface. And that's what we truly mean by adaptive and responsive type layout. And that, that's, a, that's a hard problem to solve, okay? Um, we built an app probably a year and a half ago when sort of UWP was first coming out. And for one page, we probably had five or six different layout combinations, depending on, for, this is for desktop, based on whether it was full screen, or it was a reduced layout landscape, or it was a reduced portrait, etc. We had about three or four different, sorry, five or six different combinations of, of how the screen was laid out. Um, Android's quite interesting. Um, Google's come out with this thing called material design. Um, and, and to be fair, it's not strictly tied to Android, although that's where we're typically seeing a lot of reference to it. Um, they do encourage developers across the board to adopt material design. Um, and it was really interesting when I was doing the research for this is that um, the, one of the things they really highlight is the fact that everything on the UI basically that they talk about as being a material actually had a one, has a one pixel height. So they've taken a, what would normally be a very flat um, element on the screen and they've actually given it depth, okay? But there's guidance that says that the depth can only ever be one pixel, okay? So it's sort of like, okay, so you added some artificial depth to it. Um, and so things aren't really given a true depth there, but it's kind of like an artificial mix between a 2D and a 3D world. Um, what's really interesting thing here is the blend between, you know, um, traditionally flat device, uh, elements on the screen that don't really change over time. Um, their concept of materials actually allows them to combine. So if you but, you know, nudge things together, they can actually sort of blend together and then actually merge. Um, and there's obviously some layering and some depth that they get out of um, these things actually having a depth associated with them. Um, so they have, you know, some rules regarding, you know, how you position elements and how they interact with each other. Um, so that was really interesting, um, which leads us on to where Microsoft is going with the Fluent Design. We'll see that this concept of material come up a couple of times. Uh, Microsoft actually pulls it apart a little bit and they refer to like depth and, and uh, and material is two different things, um, unlike Android, where they kind of blended into this one notion of having a, a material element, um, which is really an on-screen element that's got some aspects of a, of a material or a real-world object. Um, so this is the beginning of, of, a, of a journey for Microsoft, um, where they're transitioning away from being a very flat design language to being a more um, immersive and obviously multi-dimensional. And what they're encouraging is even if you're building for a 2D style display, think about how you can extend that to be to feel like it's more 3D, um, with the views that then when you do get into a 3D space, you can actually then break apart the layers truly into 3D um, and have the experience um, be truly immersive there. They're talking about moving away from small screen and touch to multiple devices and input types. Uh, we've already talked about that. Um, and again, moving away from the sort of the consumption and the reading of, of data um, into this more curating or actually creation. The design language or design system um, is kind of broken into sort of very five very, very high level sort of concepts. The first one being light, um, and really this is, I, I view it as two things. Um, firstly, it's an attempt to be, to to 
um, engage with users and actually make it feel like a warm and engaging experience. Um, but the other thing about light is it draws your attention to what's currently in focus. So you can imagine as you look around the, the, the screen, um, if the, you know, the, the light point was to follow where you're looking, this sounds very familiar to the HoloLens if you've ever played with that. Basically the focus point travels with where you're gazing. Um, the light kind of gives you that engagement point and then you'll find that as we move into this world, um, as you move around with the cursor, the light will actually follow you and actually light up and engage with certain elements that you, like you can see on the screen. Um, Next one is depth, um, and here as you can see with the, the transitions and then the, the layout here, um, we're starting to see elements move um, independently on the screen, so there's different um, motions and different speeds that they're moving at, um, and the idea there is to give them some you know, artificial notion of depth. Okay? Clearly these are still, it's a still a 2D display, but through the use of motion and through the use of you know, things transitioning at different speeds, we can actually get a, 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 an idea of some sort of um, depth associated with them. Motion is obviously going to be an important part. Uh, this is something that most developers really struggle. In fact, a lot of designers even struggle with this. Okay, it's very easy to come up with flat designs. A number of designers I've worked with in terms of ad development, and they go, "Hey, here's a layout for this page." Okay, you can build the rest of the app from that, can't you? And it's like, "Well, I can." Okay, but the rest of the app's going to look pretty rubbish. And what do you want me to do about transitioning from this page to the next one? Um, and for a long time, developers have kind of relied on the built-in platform transition. So Microsoft um, invested very heavily in this sort of like turnstile kind of behavior as you go between pages. Um, it's a very, very heavy transition, right? So if you're building an app that users need to get in, dun, 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 and get something done, having this big turnstile effect looks great, but it is a really heavy animation. And increasingly we're starting to see apps that don't really move off the one page, right? And the reason for that is that transitioning to a new page or a new view is a really expensive operation in terms of time commitment for a user, right? If you're actually moving things up and down on a page, you Users are, are, are there, they're ahead of you, okay? They're already planning what to do next, okay? Um, and so you can use animation and, and motion to actually do that. Because if you're on the one page and you don't think animate things and you just go, bang, move this into view, bang, move this out of view, users are just gonna go, like every time they see something move and change, right? So the use of animation is really important there. Um, the motion side of things also gives you, the, again, the renewed sense of um, depth and perspective on things as well. Uh, okay, I re referred to material a couple of times. Um, if we look at real objects in the real world, they have a lot of properties that you know, digital assets don't have. You know, they can be bounced, they can stretch, they can tear. All of those sort of types of things um, are true of real world objects. Okay, we don't get any of that in the digital sense. Now we're very early on in this journey, and so one of the things that Microsoft's looking at doing is trying to um, ad adapt sort of very flat canvases so that they blend and morph into the, or you know, coexist with the thing, the elements around them. So we can see here very heavily use of you know this this acrylic or this semi-opaque um, layer that um, they're talking about. So this one's a good example of that, where you can see the background coming through. And this is something that the first wave of Fluent Design will take advantage of. Okay, the last one is scale. Um, this is not to do with just scale in terms of how big things appear, um, although that is one element of it. Um, over the last year or so, Microsoft's been pushing this notion of scaling from um, your UWP app for, to work on phone, desktop, Xbox, just by the fact that they'll take care of it, okay? But it's more than that. It's about building an experience that actually scales, okay? So scale, when we refer to it in the context of app, doesn't just mean size of element on screen. It also means how do you interact with it? So the input types, the output types, all of those things that allow you to scale your application from, from one device to another. All right, so let's get started and actually look at some of the nuts and bolts that we do get um, as part of this first wave. And I do say the first wave because Microsoft's looking at doing this incre incrementally. Um, and in fact, even yesterday when Microsoft dropped the, the, ne the most recent Insider Preview, we saw dramatic changes between um, the previous release and the current one and the, the latest one. Um, and just in terms of um, one of the elements, so in terms of the, the acrylic um, brush that's there, they, they changed actually one of the fundamental elements in there so that it gives a completely different effect. Um, we're starting right down here um, and as part of that we're really getting these sort of these five sort of big things that they're investing in. If you looked at a lot of the announcements around Build, there was things like the, the timeline that Microsoft were talking about. 
some of those sort of end user type experiences that are tied into this as, the, as are the foundations, some of those end user experience won't make it into the fall update, but the underlying foundations of this first wave are going to make it, okay? So we talk, let's just iterate through these. Um, so we're gonna talk about the first one, which is reveal highlight. Um, and this is actually not something that's brand new. Um, so you can see here as we're moving the mouse cursor over various elements, they're lighting up. What's really new about this is the way that they light up. In the past, if you hovered over an element, it would give you some, it would probably just change the background or it might change the border color just so that you can see that it was, it was in focus, okay? Now, what, if you look closely, what you can actually see is that the light is actually being drawn to where the cursor is overlaid. So as you enter from one side, that's where the light is. And so you'll see that side of the, the element lighter than the other side. As you, as you move the cursor across the other side, you'll see that, it, that the, the lighting also follows the the cursor. Um, so that's what they're talking about, reveal highlight. The interesting thing about this is, is, as well is that when you have elements that are next door to each other, that reveal highlight actually highlights not just the element that you've currently got in focus, but it, it highlights the elements around it that you can potentially get focus. Okay, so if you had three buttons in a row and you, you were hovering over the middle one, you'd see that the next, the ones above and below would also get a slight highlight to indicate that they're another active element that you can, you can move over. The next one is this ac acrylic material, and this is really like a, a, a brush. It's typically a background brush um, that you use. Um, it's not recommended for foreground con content, and it really comes in two flavors. There's, a, there's one which is a background that, that takes the sort of the background of the, the host, so basically the, the desktop background. So you can see that here using in the calculator. Um, and as it's moved over there, you can actually, or you might be able to see that you can see traces of the background actually coming through. Um, so that's the host as a background. Background. The other one is an in-app experience where you can actually um, overlay an element, for example, a dialogue um, over your application, actually use the application itself as a background. Okay. Uh, so we're also going to see a resurgence of this notion of an accent color. So I'm just going to break out of the presentation for a second. I don't know whether you can see my um, taskbar at the bottom here has got a light green um, hint to it um, and I think if I open up say Explorer you can see that the, the taskbar across the top has actually got a very green element to it okay and, and that's because I've been enabled um, I've told it to base my accent color for the t entire device on whatever I have set as my background so for example if I go show desktop and let me just actually pull up the this Bing toolbar um, so if I go and change one of these wallpapers what you'll actually see is that the taskbar at the bottom, and let me so show you Explorer, you'll see that that's actually picked up on the background and actually starting to use that. And so as part of this next design wave, Microsoft's again going to be pushing developers to take advantage of the, the, the accent colors on the, the, the device, okay? There's a, there's a ton of different access colors. I think it's on desktop, there's like 40 odd, and then on Xbox, I think there's about 20 odd. Um, and the idea behind them is that you don't just get one color, you actually get an entire color palette. And you actually get it in two flavors. You get a light and a dark one, depending on whether you're running light mode or dark mode. Um, on this device, I'm actually running dark mode because I find it um, easier to work with. Um, but it's completely up to the user. And so the idea behind it is that you should start thinking about how you can use those within your application. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you go and use the accent color everywhere in your application, but just think about the, the, the focus points and think about the things that you want to call attention to um, that you can start to use this accent color for. And the really nice thing is that these, are work, these work very well with these um, acrylic materials. So you can see here two swatches, one which is the light theme, one which is the dark theme. And the idea there, and you can see it closely with the, the, the dark theme, or you may not be able to see it at the back there, um, but the, you can see that the elements of the background are actually coming through those swatches based on the percentage levels of opacity. So you can see that the 40% there is obviously letting more of the background through um, so that you can see it. And the idea there is that as you start to use these with your applications, you, you won't see this hard line between the desktop and your application. You'll see they're very um, blending much more. These um, acrylic materials are, uh, are actually made up of a number of different layers. Um, so there's a background layer, which will either be the desktop or it'll be your application itself, combined with various blur and blending levels. Okay. Um, 
Now, a big note here is about accessibility, power, and user settings. Okay, so the user can turn these off. Okay, so it's really important when you build your application to think about, okay, what's the fallback of this? What happens if the user does turn these off? What happens if I'm on a low power set setting where we'll, it will drop back to the fallback setting? So basically the fallback will be a flat color. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, accessibility. And you'll see when we start to actually jump into some code for this, there is actually, there's a fallback color that you can define, but then you need to think about accessibility, which actually uses a high contrast mode on the machine. I'll, sh I'll demonstrate that later on as well. Um, and that's actually different. You actually need to define that in a different way to say, hey, when I'm in a high, high accessibility mode or high contrast mode, make sure you use this brush instead, okay? Uh, so here's an example of um, a very simple application that does make use of the, um, in this case it's the, it's the window style acrylic brush um, and you can see that it's the window style because it's actually letting the background of windows through um, and the first two panes are both using this acrylic brush at different opacity levels. So if you've got this sort of, you know, multiple sort of navigation style panes that you want to make use of, you can actually use two different acrylic brushes. Don't use the same one twice because you'll end up with a sort of zebra effect where you can see a hard line between them but then they'll be the same color and that kind of looks weird um, but you can definitely use them with different opacities don't go nuts and definitely don't use these acrylic brushes on the foreground content right so what, but what I mean by that is this in the, in the main area of your application don't use the acrylic brush on there now the exception to that is if you're building very utility type applications so for example a calculator you can actually use the acrylic brush as the background for the whole thing but just bear in mind those are those are really designed for short-lived style applications like the calculator that users jump into do something it's probably one screen and that's it and then they jump away from it Okay. All right, let's just jump back to here. Um, okay, so next one is connected animations. Um, this is actually something that we've seen before in a couple of different kind of things from Microsoft. Um, and this is where you click on an element on one screen and it transitions to a new screen, but you go and go, oh, what did I click on again? And so the idea there is that if you were to use a connected animation, so actually animate the item that you clicked on into the new screen or into the new layout, um, it's provide, it doesn't provide that, it doesn't make it that disjointed experience that you'd otherwise get. Um, here they're actually showing the transition between two screens. In the demo, uh, what I'll actually show is how you can use that just on the one screen, okay? So you can actually use it anywhere. It's not really, it's not locked into just page transitions. Um, it's really just to try and connect the user from what they've clicked on in one area of the application to where you want them to focus on in another area of the application. Uh, conscious controls, um, this is something that will, for, for the, at least the first wave, will actually start to be see built into Windows more than we will see it built into controls or to um, things that the developer can use. Here we're actually seeing the search bar for, for, um, for Edge, um, adopting some of the new stuff around the, using the stylus, okay? So rather than bringing up a stylus panel as part of the, the main virtual keyboard, it actually drops down in situ, allowing a very quick um, text input. Um, you also see that the stylus input um, is much more adaptive, so you can you can go back and cross elements out. Um, and this is actually reminiscent of the sort of the Windows uh, sort of seven style keyboard uh, um, uh, stylus input, where it was very very. Um, uh, it had been heavily styled towards uh, rapid text input, um, and we lost some of that in the sort of the eight eight one time frame. Okay, um, the other area that you would see conscious controls is um, the, and we saw this in the one Windows um, 8, 8 one time frame as well, is um, intelligent scroll bars. So for example, if you had a, like a list of items, if you were doing it on a touch display, you would see, you'd actually see very a very, very thin um, scroll bar appear. If you actually use a mouse, you'll actually see a much wider style scroll bar. And that's what they're really talking about, conscious controls. They're not, they're talking about being conscious of what device you're running on, so whether it be a phone, a desktop, desktop, um, Xbox, but also the type of input, so whether the user is using a touch input or whether they're using mouse and keyboard input. <clears throat> the last thing we're going to talk about is this perspective parallax, and this is the first attempt at trying to give developers the tool to try and give you that, that, that depth of, of an application. So you can see here that <clears throat> as we're scrolling the screen, the image at the top is actually scrolling with it, but it doesn't scroll at the same speed because that would it would just slide off the screen. Then it actually scrolls at a slightly different sort of that parallax top effect. 
Um, we did see this very heavily used in the panorama on Windows Phone um, and back then it was very difficult for developers to get their head around what they should or shouldn't be doing with it. What we'll see with this is that we're actually seeing a much nicer model to work with and the developer has a lot more control over how, it's in, how it engages. All right, we're almost at the point where I get to jump into some code. Um, okay, so this is a ramp up to the new design, design system um, and there is a ton of platform guidance tools samples community. Well, there is for UWP in general. I must caution you if you're trying to look for really good samples of this, um, there are few and far between. There's a couple that came out of the demos that they did at Build. Um, there's really good guidance in terms of each of these elements that we've just talked about um, and how you can go about adopting those. The one caution I would have is firstly, the inside of Builds are iterating quite frequently. You do need to grab those and you will need to grab the updated SDK tools that come out with each of those builds. The reason being is that even between um, builds, the names of some of the brushes change, the name of some of the elements change. Um, so you just need to be aware of those that, you know, if you jump in at this early stage, there is, you do need to keep up with it, otherwise um, you'll get left behind. All right, and finally, we're, it's a platform for design, right? So we're seeing a whole bunch of, of areas that Microsoft is investing in. Um, New controls, so there's things like a new tree view that a that control that they're, they're coming in a new, a new wave. Um, going forward, we're likely to see them invest heavily in 360 media playback, because um, you can imagine this ties very well into their sort of their VR, AR type story, because um, obviously, you know, looking at 360 playback on a PC, where well, you have to actually do this to see around it, not gonna work, right? But it works really well in the sort of the HoloLens kind of space. All right, so let's just jump in and actually take a look at some of this in code. So, um, we're going to start in Blend, um, and hopefully the Blend gods will be with me. Uh, we're going to start with a brand new application. We're going to pick a UWP, so a Universal Windows application, um, and I'm not very creative, so I'm going to call it App6. Um, the thing, if you haven't worked with UWP before, you will notice this drop down, down up here, which basically says which target platform, which minimum version do you want to target? The difference is minimum version basically says, okay, well, what's the lowest version of Windows that this will can run on? Okay, so basically it's the version that you will, when users download it from the store, it does a system check to see that they're on that minimum version, right? And the target version basically says, okay, well, what, what's the set of APIs that you want to be accessible via this application? Now, I'm actually going to make these both the same. I'm going to pick the inside preview. The reason being is that the new stuff we're going to be doing is basically a lot of XAML stuff, so it's going to be using the XAML. Um, if we were to support m like a lower minimum version, what we'd find is that those XAML elements would call a runtime exception on those minimum versions, uh, on the, the platforms that aren't at the target version. There are ways, ways around those. Those involve writing a little bit of code to, to make use of the new resources on the newer platforms, right? So you can do it, um, but the easiest way to get started on it is basically set these two to be the same. If you've got questions on compatibility and how to get around those things, feel free to grab me afterwards and I can walk you through it. All right. So this is the design experience in Blend. Um, you'll get very familiar with the loading designer text. Um, doo -doo -doo. Right, uh, so the first thing to note is that the design experience currently looks like a phone, okay? And that's re because we've kind of currently got the first in this um, drop-down selected. Um, it's not overly helpful, particularly since we spend most of our time building for desktop. Um, but you can see that there are all sorts of different types of um, devices that you can preview the way your app looks, okay? So you get a true design time experience. Um, for those different devices. Um, there's a whole conversation I can talk to about, you know, what this scale factor means and different resolutions, etc. That's a talk for another day. So let's just pick up um, a desktop display um, and I'll just zoom that in. And we're going to start with a very basic kind of interface. Um, and I do tend to spend quite a lot of time just writing XAML in the editor just because it's actually rather painful to do it using the design experience. So we're just gonna do a couple of columns, okay? And into the first column, we're just gonna put a grid. And I'm gonna start off with a really boring grid. Um, let's make it gray. Let's set the width to be, say, 300. And we're just gonna run that, okay? 
Now, for those who are familiar with UWP and are going to watch this demo going, yeah, there's a new control called a split view that you can use that does the stuff that we're about to do. Um, yes, I'm aware of that. It's kind of got problems with the acrylic panel at the, the brushes at the moment. Um, there is also a new navigation view coming, which is supposed to simplify the whole sort of layout and having a navigation pane on the left, which is kind of what I'm mocking up here. Um, that's also pre-baked um, and I didn't want to risk it for the demo. So we're just going to use a very, very, very bland grey um, um, grid for the time being. And the first thing we're going to do is actually change the background here to be one of these new acrylic resources. So we're going to, it's going to be a system control uh, acrylic window brush. And hopefully I got the name right. And we'll run that up. And I'm just going to show you the window store. The reason being is I needed something which has got a little bit of color because otherwise you're not going to see the, the transparency that's there. Uh, so I don't know whether you can see that, but as I move this around, you can actually see some of the background elements coming through. And similarly, if I scroll this, you'll actually see that it moves. And I think that makes it a little bit more visible for the people at the back who can't see it. Um, all right, so there, that is actually bringing through what's behind the entire application. It's not content that's within the application, it's content that's actually behind, sitting behind um, the application, okay? All right, so the other thing we're going to do is we're going to change the behavior of this left-hand panel. Um, so we're going to add some content to the, the right-hand side. And as the screen comes down in size, we're going to dynamically set the, that um, left-hand pane to disappear. And then when it appears, we're actually going to make it appear over the top of the content with an opacity so that we can actually see the content on the page. Kind of like the whole split view way that it works in um, UWP. So for example, on here, uh, let me pick one that's actually got it. Um, no, the store does not have one. Um, I was thinking it would have the, the button at the top. Oh, there we go. All right, so this is the type of effect that we're kind of going for, but what we're going to do is we're actually going to set the background of that, that pane to be one of these acrylic brushes that actually uses the content within the application. All right, let's get started with that. Um, we're going to drop in a list view. Um, and I'm going to make it, I'm going to sit it before the grid that we just added. The reason being is what I want to happen is that when the grid comes out, I want it to sit over the top of the list view. Um, so we'll do that. Um, now we're also going to set this to be in the first column. So it's going to appear alongside there. Uh, you don't really want to see me create a whole bunch of data. So let's go and create some sample data. And I'll just drag that onto our list view. All right, now we're cooking with gas. We've actually got some content on there. So let me take a look at the layout for that. And we're just gonna bump it up a little bit. So we'll say, say 400 for that. Um, which maybe not that big. And just increase the size of our image. So we've actually got some nice big images there. And so you can see that the design experience is sort of keeping up with what I'm doing. Um, and we'll see in a sec when I jump out of this template that it goes back to having that on the screen. So we've got, we've got some content. Uh, this is design time content. At the moment, I've set it so that it will actually appear when I run it as well. Um, but you can obviously toggle that behavior off. Uh, now, the next thing we're going to do is, as I mentioned, is I want this pane on the left-hand side to disappear as the screen size comes down. So rather than writing a whole bunch of codes to that, I'm actually going to use a couple of visual states. So I'm going to use create a state group called size states. And the first one is going to be my narrow state. And then the next one is going to be my wide state. So my narrow state, I want this panel to go away. Um, but actually what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to say that I want this list view to basically span both columns so it appears underneath it. Um, and then I'm actually going to create a button that's so going to hide and show this pane. So let's grab our list view. I want it to be now in the, the zero column and I want it to span two columns. Okay, so it's now going to appear underneath that panel. Okay, and notice how I'm in sort of state recording mode. So as I switch back between these states, you'll see that it actually switches that kind of behavior. Um, now let me add a, a button onto the screen. And so we're going to use this button to actually drive the, um, the, the hiding and showing of that left hand pane. Uh, let me just dock that just to the bottom so it's out of our way. Yep. 
And I really only want that button to show when we're in this narrow mode. So let me just actually set the visibility on this to collapsed. And we'll click on our narrow view and actually show that um, here. And what you'll see is I'm switching between writing stuff in the code window and using the property window. I'm using the property window when I want the state recorder to actually record what I'm doing and I'm using the code window when I don't want it to do that. Okay, so you'll see now as I, if I scroll down to the bottom of the screen, as I switch between those modes, you'll actually see that in the narrow mode that button appears as well. In order to hide and show the, the panel, I'm also going to create another state group, um, which is my panel states. And this one's going to be show pane and hide pane. And so for the, the hide pane, I'm basically going to pick the, the grid and I'm going to set it to collapsed. Okay. So the last thing I need to do is obviously in the button, the event handler for that, I need it to actually do some work. So let's actually go and do that. Uh, visual state manager dot go to state. Um, I need to specify this, so the whole page. And what I'm going to do is query to see what current state the pane's at. So I do pane current state equals, um, well, so let's actually say not equal to Okay, so basically we, we're looking to see what, what the current state is um, and based on that, and I've got those the wrong way around, so let's actually change that to not equal to hide pane. Make sure that, that that's correct. Um, so that should toggle between those two, two states for me. The last thing I need to do is actually, the whole purpose of this demo, is when I'm in my narrow stage, I actually want to change the background of this element so it actually allows that the, the app content to come through. So let me click, click on the, the grid again, and I'm going to go over here to the list of brushes that are available. Now you'll notice that the acrylic brushes aren't actually in here, so I'm going to pick one of the default ones which is in here, um, and set that not to the visible focus. I want to pick up the background. Set that to the accent button. So it's to change the color there, obviously not to the right one. So in our code window down here, let me just find the right one in our visual states. It's this one here. And this one's going to be our system control acrylic element brush. All right, let's give that a whirl and let's see what it actually comes up with now. Okay, who can pick out the design flaw in what I've just done? Or the, the coding flaw, I should say. Okay, I've done all of this nice stuff to control what should or shouldn't happen when I resize the screen, okay? How am I handling when I'm switching between those states? I'm not. So, I need to come back in here, and these two states, I could run some code that hooks into the, the size change of the window, um, but that seems a lot of code for me, and I'm lazy, so we're gonna do this. And for our wide window, we're going to do this. So we're going to add another state trigger into here. And these triggers are basically what we refer to as an adaptive trigger. Let me make that a bit bigger. And so for the different size screens, and it's looking at the width of the screen, it's going to work out which of the visual states to go to. So it's basically taking a whole of the, a lot of that heavy lifting for me away. Um, you notice that I did. I put a one value in for the minimum width for the, for the narrow one to start with and then corrected it to zero. Basically in the designer, if I put zero, it would have left it as the default. And for some weird reason, the default doesn't work. You actually do need to manually set it in there. So I set it to one and then corrected it. Uh, so if we remember what our display currently looks like, it's currently like this. And actually you can see the content from the store coming through. Um, in the background. So as I move that, you can see the store background. If I resize this down, what you start to see now is that if I scroll the content within the app, you can see that that's coming through from our panel on the left and I've got my toggle button to actually hide and close it. Okay. So all of that, and I wrote, I think, one line of code that was spoken over a couple of lines of code. So basically one line of code to do all of that. Uh, the rest was all declaratively done in XAML. Right, so that in a nutshell is acrylics. Now there's a, there's an, a couple of other little things that we can do. So for example, um, the toggle button, we can apply, we can change the, the styling on this. So we can actually say style equals uh, static resource uh, button reveal style. 
So it's, that's going to be one of our new uh, styles. Let me just run this one up. So we'll scroll this down, and it's a little hard to see, but what we what you can kind of see is that as I move the cursor around this, you know, it's very very difficult to see. Um, so as you go in from one side, that side gets a lot fainter, and then as you move across the other side, the other side gets fainter. Uh, right now, you're not really seeing much of that. Um, it's very hard to see in the current builds. Okay, um, there's. Plenty more to explore. Um, I know that we're conscious of time, so I kind of want to open up to some questions in the last two minutes before I get kicked off stage. Questions? Um, so basically, I understand that there's a lot of features in XAML that are not going to be available in later versions of Windows. Sorry, in previous versions of Windows, like the acrylic um, thin brush, for example. So how, if I already have a pre-existing UWP app, yep. can I enable that? without actually changing my minimum version of app to keep targeting like the yep. old, all the older So you, you can do that. You can't do, you, you wouldn't be able to reference that brush in the XAML because that would break. What you can do though is you can actually either create your own custom brush or um, in the code behind when your app launches, you can replace a brush with one of the acrylic brushes. So on the unloaded event, for example? Yeah. Even, even before that, you can probably do it as soon as the app launches, basically. As soon as it's passed through your application resources, you can go and substitute your, you know, the, the brush that you defined in the resources with a brush that's a credit brush, yep, and that'll work. So. Um, and actually, one of, one of the things that we've got in one of our libraries that we use, because we do a lot of cross-platform work, we do, we do a lot of work with Xamarin Forms, we've actually got a cross-platform library that actually allows you to specify an acrylic brush, and it runs on UWP with the acrylic brush, and then it just goes, goes to a fallback color on the other platforms, so. All right, can we give Nick another round of applause, please?